All right, I am going to start recording and let me share, get myself set up. We want this one. Okay, and we all see the screen, okay? Slides, yep, all right, good. All right, so, yep, let's kick this off. Um, Naomi, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Today, we're going to look at um, a review of doing FRM economics, so we're going to think about principles of economics and how that applies to the work that we do at the core. We'll talk about what flood risk is and how we assess flood risk. And then um, uncertainty is a really big piece. So we'll look at uh, the different pieces of uncertainty in calculating flood risk or assessing flood risk, excuse me. We'll talk about how we incorporate our estimates of uncertainty about flood risk. And then we'll look at what else we have to uh, assess beyond expected annual damage. Um, and so this agenda that you see right here, this is a really abbreviated uh, version of 209. Uh, this, we're, we're basically going to cover the majority of the lectures that we cover in 209 over 30, 24 hours, I think, is, is lectures. We're going to do it in about two hours. So it's super abbreviated. Um, I hope that you find the material to be concise but still um, consumable. And, and at any point, please um, stop me for questions. I do have to um, allocate the credit to this presentation to a whole bunch of people. I have taken from a lot of presentations, mostly from the instructors from 209, but also other economists uh, who have helped me with presentations uh, over the last year. So all these great folks have helped put together the presentation you'll get today. All right, so let's get a review of economics and then a review of economics of FRM. So decisions inherently involve trade-offs, right? And and the study of economics involves weighing these uh, trade-offs so to identify the best decision. So in economics speak, we're looking for the optimal decision, and that's from the perspective of a rational decision maker. So from the perspective of the consumer, excuse me, um, we can take the example of real estate, right? It's probably common to want a bigger house. Uh, amongst those looking to get into real estate. So you want more square feet than a smaller house with less square feet, right? And that's that's one of the um, basic foundations of, of studying utility uh, curves and uh, things like that. So our, our budget as federal employees probably precludes our ability to purchase a mansion, right? So um, we're going to look for the biggest house that, that our budget can afford. And now from the perspective of the government, um, it's probably common to want to build more infrastructure than less. Uh, there's been a lot of news about that the last few weeks. And the government we may um, ideally want to play the role of Oprah, right? So you get a new road, they get a new road, these other people get a new road. But uh, government revenues are limited, uh, particularly in the short run, um, as is the government's ability to borrow sustainably. Um, so if borrowing grew infinitely, the interest alone would significantly limit the ability to allocate resources elsewhere. So we have to find uh, the optimal solution, right? So in technical terms, we're talking about constrained optimization. Uh, if you are relatively new to economics, but you have taken a class in calculus, uh, you are already familiar with this concept. We're talking about um, constrained optimization that's solved by maximizing or minimizing a function subject to a constraint. Um, and perhaps with the help of a Lagrange multiplier. So relating this to the work that we do in the core and core style economics, we attempt to maximize net benefits, or we're maximizing benefits subject to the cost by comparing the benefits of various plans to the cost of various plans. Um, and then we saw to solve for the optimal amount of flood risk management, we maximize the benefits of the potential project subject to the cost. Okay? Um, so Let's look at um, the economics of FRM. So the role of economics in FRM involves assessing the potential reductions in flood risk. We weigh the trade-offs, so the reduction in flood risk against the cost of reducing flood risk, and then we maximize increases in net national economic value while protecting the nation's environment. So weighing the trade-offs as to maximize the net increases in National economic values, we're talking about NED benefits, right, national economic development benefits. The economists solve for the plan that maximizes benefits subject to the cost, which ultimately identifies in a very discrete way, right, because we look at a, a, a discrete number, a countable number of alternatives, the national economic development plan. 
So this is a plan that provides the highest increase in net national economic value. Now we typically focus on flood risk reduction as our benefit category, but there are others such as emergency and cleanup cost savings and advanced bridge replacement. Um, quickly, I, I'd like to know if anybody has uh, come across other benefit categories in doing um, in evaluating flood risk beyond what we have on this slide. Now let me just look for my chat. Vehicles. So vehicles are probably we could consider that um, part of flood risk reduction, right? Damage to autos that is um, that's wrapped into flood risk reduction. That's just a particular damage category. Local costs foregone. Uh, Andrew, you want to talk a little bit more about what you mean about local costs foregone? Sure. If uh, say the locals were planning a protective measure and we build something, it offsets their cost, which could kind of benefit. Yeah, that. So that's a good point. Um, that does get into defining the without project condition, um, but I I think I'll leave that defining that line to the to the planners um, and the folks who are uh, plan formulation specialists. All right, so our flood risk reduction, that's identified through counterfactual analysis, right? We're looking at two different states of the future. The benefits are identified as the difference in damages between these two states of the future, the with and the without project conditions. And once we've carried out the counterfactual analysis for a variety of plans, um, let's quickly look at how we determine which plan to recommend, and we're going to look at this conceptually. Um, and while most of you are probably familiar with all of this stuff that I'm talking about, this is like the most fun part of the presentation for me because we get into um, some nerdy economic type stuff. So before we dive into the details of calculating benefits with HECFDA, I'd just like to spend another minute conceptually looking at the economics of flood risk management, and in particular the identification of the NED plan. So if you consider a series of alternatives that consist of only differently sized levies, and I know typically different alternatives are not distinguished by the size of the levy, that's when you get to optimization, but to make this example a little bit um, simpler, just consider different alternatives that are represented by different size levies. So in the diagram on the top, the y-axis measures uh, dollars in average annual equivalent terms. The x-axis measures the plan size, which in this case um, is the size of the levy, and we're going to assume that the alternatives are represented on a continuum, so you have a continuum of different sizes of levy. The green line represents total benefits, and the blue line equals total costs. So we're going to, again, assume that the plan size is valued on a continuum to make this clean and easy. So you can imagine that um, total benefits are going to increase as levy size increases, but eventually the rate at which benefits increase is going to slow down or perhaps not increase at all. We're talking about the marginal returns to uh, levy size, right? Um, what we want to do is to solve for P star, which is marked by the dashed red line. That is the plan that um, the plant size for which the positive distance between total benefits and total costs is the greatest. That's where we have maximum net benefits. So we, in, in the lower diagram, we see that P star must occur at the intersection of marginal benefits and marginal costs. And this is one of those um, foundations of economics that we have reached our optimum where marginal benefits equals marginal costs. This is the point at which an additional foot of levy incurs a marginal cost just equal to the marginal benefit. That is, we have found our optimal plan. So we can no longer add net benefits to the potential recommended plan um, as going any higher in levy size would decrease net benefits beyond P star because each additional foot costs more than the benefits brought by the additional foot. So these principles, um, they also mean that the once you get to optimization, that the optimized recommended plan should always be the medium plan. Okay, and I, I'd like for you guys to think about that a little bit. 
Um, and I'd like to just, if you have questions or you have an idea about why that is, uh, please come to office hours so we can talk about that a little bit further. Why the, the recommended plan and optimization should typically always be the medium plan. All right, so now we have the concept down. Um, in terms of the economics, let's talk about how we calculate benefits. From here on, it's mostly statistics. Um, all right, so what is flood risk? Many of you are, are probably familiar with this diagram. Um, th this is the diagram that displays the three components of risk analysis, right? We have risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication. Today, we're going to focus on, on risk assessment. That's the, the part of risk analysis where we quantify risk. Our estimation of benefits and identification of the National Economic Development Plan, they're born out of risk assessment. That's, that's our, our biggest um, responsibility, right? So economists work also in risk management and risk communication. Um, and, and I would argue that risk communication is almost as big of a piece of our job as as uh, risk assessment because we have to communicate our findings in a way that is inclusive of all audiences. Right? We have to be able to communicate risk in a way that everybody can can understand in, in bits and pieces of information that is consumable. Um, and here's my pitch for writing reports well. Uh, there is a wealth of literature on writing technical content using plain language. Um, so I, I just I want to suggest if, if you haven't seen these or read these things before, um, look at plainlanguage.gov and, and Deidre McCloskey's short book um, titled Economical Writing. Deidre's uh, book may give you the most, the most bang for $10 that you will ever get. Um, I think we, we tend to write reports in a way that is not um, consumable for everybody, and I think that we can improve a little bit because risk communication is, is a job. Um, and Michael, do I know Deidre? Uh, yes. Um, I, I'm not going to say that Deidre and I are, are <laughs> close, but, but I have taken, I took a course with Deidre um, at University of Illinois Chicago. That's where I did my undergrad, um, and that's one of the places where she teaches. Um, and I attended many of her, um, her, her lectures outside of class. Um, she's a, a very important um, economist at UIC, um, and, and she's a she's one of the coolest people I've ever met. Um, so, wait, what are the names smart. of it? Plainlanguage dot. Plainlanguage dot gov. Um, so, gov. plain language at plainlanguage dot gov, they give you um, basically guidance on how to implement the Plain Writing Plain Language Act, Plain Writing Act. Um, and basically, the Plain Writing Act or Plain Language Act, whichever it is, if you're not familiar with it, that tells us that if uh, we are writing something that uh, describes a service to the public, and and that's everything that almost everything that we write, then we have to write it in a plain way that everybody can understand. And and when we think about everybody, you know, we want the typical person um, that we find on the street to be able to understand our work. Uh, so that, that means avoiding jargon, writing clearly, avoiding acronyms, avoiding abbreviations, all these types of things. We want to be able to communicate to everybody, um, both communicating the assessment of risk and, and communicating how we um, recommend buying that risk down. And then the economical writing book, it's Deidre McCloskey. McCloskey. Yeah, I'll, I'll write that one because it's – Thank you. It's, yeah. Yeah, I had a hard time spelling Deidre, and then I lost what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> Deidre McCloskey. Oops, I spelled that wrong. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So let's let's look at flood risk. We're going to start our – we're just going to spend the rest of the time in, in risk assessment. So as we stated at the beginning, the primary benefit category – that, that we, we use in flood risk management is flood risk reduction. Now, flood risk generally is, is assessed as the probability of getting wet times the consequences of getting wet. Um, we can take this pic, the picture on this slide as, as an example, right? So the risk of flooding at the level of flooding seen here in this image is the probability that this flood occurs in any given year times the consequences of this flood. So risk 
generally uh, is, is probability times consequences, uh, and, and that's for all types of hazards, not just flooding, but also wildfire and um, wind and uh, even we could even think about upside risk. So probability and consequences, this applies to evaluating risk um, on Wall Street too. Um, so here we are going to use expected annual damage as our measure of risk. We get expected annual damage through um, through probability times consequences. Um, but this um, and other possible floods, they, they do not occur every year. So the expected value of flood damage for this particular event is going to be lower, I'm sorry, higher than expected annual damage, right? Expected annual damage uh, is based on a frequency approach. We're basically taking a probability weighted value of all of the um, different, the, the consequences of the different floods. Um, so this is sort of like averaging a large value together with observations that have a value of zero, right? Because you're not going to have a flood like this every year, and some years you don't have floods. Uh, in addition, we we weigh the consequences of the different floods by their probabilities. And, and that's the conceptual idea of expected annual damage. Um, the, the expected damage from flooding in any given year. That's our most important measure of flood risk, expected annual damage. So let, let's look at um, risk, just uh, the, the function of risk a little bit more carefully. So in detail, risk is a function of the hazard. The hazard is what can cause harm. So that's the water. The performance of the flood risk management measures. So how will the system react? Is there a chance that the levee will um, breach? Exposure, so who and what are in harm's way? Uh, typically, we evaluate the exposed assets, right? The structures, the cars, um, sometimes we look at uh, different types of infrastructure. We look at vulnerability. How susceptible are the structures to harm? And vulnerability is typically indexed to the first floor elevation. And right? so if that first floor elevation is real low, then a structure um, is particularly vulnerable. If the first floor elevation is high, that decreases the vulnerability of the structure. And then finally, what the, the consequences um, so how much harm will occur when the exposed people and assets um, are inundated with flooding? So again, this, this equation used on the screen is, is generally used to evaluate risk for all types of hazards, not just inland flooding, uh, but AGC FDA is a tool that is motivated as, um, as an inland flooding uh, risk assessment tool. It is used for coastal, and I know you folks in NAD are um, also well versed in postal, um, but we're, we're just going to focus on inland. I will talk a little bit about using FDA for coastal studies during our second session. All right, so that's our big function. And then we can simplify this. Typically in the core in particular, we talk about flood risk as being probability times consequences. So flood probability, that's the left side. Um, and the consequences are on the right side. Now, a statistic such as um, the annual exceedance probability, that is a function of the hazard in performance, whereas dollar damages and life loss per given flood magnitude, that's represented on the right side. Um, so we're thinking about um, expected annual damages are a measure of consequences. All right. Bear with me one second. Okay. Now, consequences are, we see that consequences are a function of exposure, vulnerability, and um, consequences. So we wrap all that uh, up and, and refer to exposure, vulnerability, and consequences as just consequences. Now, we use these three to determine whether a particular study area is going to have low or high consequences. Let's look uh, at an example. We may have 100,000 people in a floodplain, but they aren't highly vulnerable because they are, are well off. Um, they may have a lot of warning time. There are evacuation options. Many of the homeowners may have taken um, private approaches to flood proofing. 
And that's versus a floodplain with 500 people that may be extremely vulnerable because they are disadvantaged, lack resources, have limited warning time. Um, so we have to take all these things, the exposure, the vulnerability, and and the amount of harm into account to evaluate consequences. And consequences, together with 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 probability, give us our measure of risk. So. Based on this slide and, and everything that we've covered with this slide, um, do you think that the population at risk in and of itself is a good metric for measuring life safety risk? Yes or no, please type that into chat. Give you just another minute. We got a lot of no's, that's great, right? The population at risk um, just reflects exposure, and we have to take so many other things into account when we're evaluating risk. So essentially, there is a sequence of events for each um, study that leads to flooding, and our goal is to break or fix something in that sequence, whether it's the hazard, the performance, the exposure, the vulnerability, um, and the consequences. I, I, th th this is a, um, a really important concept, all of the pieces of risk. So I just want to take a look at this from another perspective. All right, so we look at river flow, river depth, and levee performance as our probability. And then property damage, life safety, loss of critical infrastructure, that feeds into consequences, and those two things together give us risk. You can imagine different combinations of probability and consequences as demonstrated on the, the right side of this screen where red designates high risk, yellow demonstrates medium risk, and green low risk. So, and you may already be familiar with this because this is how we um, categorize risk in the risk register, right? We look at the uh, chance that the um, object uh, identified or the decision identified is going to happen and the consequences of that thing happening. That's how we use our risk register. So if we have high probability, large consequences, that's that's uh, high risk. Either high probability and small consequences or small probability and large consequences, that gives us medium risk. And then small probability, small consequences, that's low risk. This is from a, a categorical um, approach. And when we get to actually assessing quantitatively, um, we see that this plays out. So uh, let's, let's look at an example uh, based on the, the previous uh, this this square this uh, image on the right slide. Let's use this image to identify which area has higher flood risk. Where flood risk is probability times consequences. Um, so we're we're thinking just categorically, either um, low probability, high probability, and low consequences, high consequences. Which of these study areas have a higher risk? For study area A, this has a 50% chance, annual chance of flooding with a 15-foot flood depth. Study area B has a 1% annual chance of flooding with a 4-foot flood depth. Which study area has higher flood risk? Please type your answers into the chat. I'll give you just another minute. All right, so uh, this is a trick question. <laughs> uh, I like trick questions sometimes, they can be fun. So study area A has a high probability but low consequences, right? Because study area A that is, um, you have some agricultural plots. I think that this is actually up the street from me. Uh, Whereas study area B, you have a low probability, but higher consequences because this is um, a more urban area. This is this is Sacramento. So they they both have medium risk. If we look at lower high probability, lower high consequences, the combinations of um, high probability and low consequences on the left give us medium risk. The con the the combination of low probability and high consequences on the right give us medium risk. 
All right. So we've talked about this from um, a categorical or a qualitative perspective. Let's get into how we assess flood risk quantitatively. Um, we're going to look at hazard performance, exposure, vulnerability, and consequences, because that's what feeds into our, our function of risk. Now, the hazard for us, um, and in particular, following the methods of FDA, involve hydrology. Now, that's the, the focus of the water in the watershed, how much uh, water moves in the watershed for a given amount of rain. We also want the rate of flow and the frequency of that flow in the river. Hydraulics is the focus, uh, the focus is the water that's already in the channel um, or, or in the floodplain. We want the, the depth of the water for a given rate of flow, that's our rating curve, um, and then the velocity. And AGCFDA does not yet consider velocity, um, but that's, that's on my wish list of things to do, is to include velocity. Now, geotechnical, the focus here is levee performance. And so that's the chance of failure for a given flood magnitude. And then economics, um, our specialty here, that's our focus. The focus is the stuff that's in the floodplain, right? The value of the assets, the number of people in the floodplain, uh, that gives us exposure. The first four elevations, the number of stories, that gets us vulnerability, damage, life, life loss for a given flood magnitude, and indirect economic impact that gives us consequences. So we'll look briefly at one through three. Our focus is, is number four. Um, if you are interested in any of the pieces, one through three, getting into more detail, there are full um, presentations on YouTube, uh, as we mentioned. So we're going to look at an illustration now of the way that we assess flood risk, um, and this follows the methods described in Engineering Manual 1110-2-1619. Um, I hope you had a chance to review uh, so that you can follow along. If you have questions, again, please just take yourself off mute. So how we get to expected annual damage, which is our, our main measure of uh, flood risk. So we start with a given frequency event, so um, an event that has a, a certain probability of being exceeded, and we calculate the flow from the flow exceedance probability function. That's the key hydrologic relationship. From this flow, we calculate the stage from the stage flow function, that's the rating curve. That's our key hydraulic relationship. From this stage, we calculate uh, damage from the stage damage function. That's our key economic relationship. Um, and note here that not all stages result in damage, right? Because there is um, a, there's a portion of the rating curve that um, does not correspond with damages. Now, combining these three together, we calculate the probability of a given uh, value of damage from the damage exceedance function. This brings together the three functions. Now, this damage exceedance function on the bottom right-hand side, that's the function from which we calculate expected annual damage. We integrate the damage exceedance function, which means we calculate the area under the curve. Um, and that gives us the estimate of expected annual damage. And you can think of this, again, as like a probability weighted average. One note, um, the way that we link this relationship assumes that uh, you start with a flow exceedance probability function, and then you tie that to a rating curve to implicitly develop a stage probability function. That's connected with the stage damage function. Um, it is possible that you start with the stage exceedance probability function, um, for the purpose of, of this course, I'm, I'm mostly going to assume that you're starting with flow exceedance and then working with a rating curve, but I'll try to touch back to when we start with stage probability. Um, and I will mention, or, or we'll talk um, during session two a little bit about when we use stage probability um, to begin with or, or when we use the flow exceedance and rating curve uh, that I think there are it's really important to talk about these two things as well as index functions. So we will get to that on our FDA in practice presentation. All right. So let's, we're, we talked about how we get to expected annual damage, right? We integrate the damage exceedance probability function. That's the function on the right-hand side. Now I want to think about how we evaluate with project expected annual damage. Um, how are these relationships modified? which relationships are modified 
to evaluate the risk that um, we expect to occur in the with project condition. This slide is going to walk us through the example um, of an alternative that builds a dam upstream of a town. So the dam is going to hold back flow near our town such that for large events, the peak flows are reduced. Okay, so we're looking at um, a, an event with a low probability of exceedance and for a range of that probability of exceedance, the peak discharges are reduced. This will continue until the dam becomes dangerously full, at which point the releases will increase um, and eventually reach back to the without project condition. Now, for a given flow, the stage is going to stay the same, right? Because the river, river channel in this case has not been changed. So there's nothing about the identification of the stage from a given flow that changes. The only thing that has changed is the, the flow exceedance probability function. So the, the peak discharges um, for, for a range of events. Now for a given stage, the damages are the same, assuming that the dam does not encourage or discourage development. But because we have decreased the frequency of certain peak stages, we have truncated the damage frequency curve. And this reduces the area under the damage frequency curve, which means what? What does that mean if we reduce the area under the damage frequency curve? Give you a second, please type your answers into the chat. What happens if we reduce the area underneath the damage exceedance probability function? And I'm thinking in technical terms here. We have lower damages, right? We have a, a lower expected annual damage. So like we, we get expected annual damage by integrating the damage exceedance probability function. Again, we're thinking about that as a probability weighted average. If we reduce the, um, the, the area under the damage exceedance probability function or, or we throw out some of the, the combinations of probability and consequences, then we get a lower measure of, of flood risk. So different types of flood risk management measures modify different input relationships, where the input relationships are, are these um, relationships on the screen. So we saw that with the example of a dam, the flow frequency relationship is modified, but not the stage discharge relationship because nothing has changed about the specifications or dimensions of the channel. And the stage damage function does not change as nothing has changed about how the elevation of the river, the flooding affects damages to structure, damage to the structures. In the case of channelization, um, all else equal, a deeper channel will modify the stage discharge relationship. Right, but not the flow frequency or stage damage. So if the only thing you're doing is making the channel deeper, the only thing that changes is the stage for a given flow. In the case of a levee, below the top of the levee, the floodplain water surface elevations are truncated, right? So the, the water in the floodplain is going to be, or the depth in the floodplain is going to be zero as long as the river is below the top of the levee. So in this case, the stage um, flow relationship is modified, so for a range of peak discharges in the channel, the depth of flooding is zero in the floodplain. The modification of the stage flow function truncates damages below a given stage. That also modifies the stage damage function, which reduces the frequency of damages that's graphed for. So different alternatives modify different relationships, um, and I, I think it's useful for us to understand uh, how that occurs, so that we can troubleshoot, um, but also communicate our assessment. So let's look at expected annual damage reduced. That's our measure of benefits, and we're going to stay on the dam example. Uh, in the diagram on the screen, we have our without project uh, expected annual damages. That's the area under the, the damage exceedance probability function and with, without project EAD is represented by the blue triangle. After construction, we have reduced the frequency of damages to just the green 
area, thereby reducing EAD. The green area represents residual expected annual damage. That's damages we have chosen through risk management policies not to reduce. And the gray area represents the damages we have prevented. And it is this damage reduction, the gray area, that describes the project benefit. The damages that, that folks would have to pay for in the without project condition, but no longer will have to pay for. Now, is it worth it? That That is a risk management question. Um, but how much does it cost to reduce those damages? We get that from class engineering, real estate, um, and environmental. We may spend a little time on this after we discuss incorporating, or we will say, we will get into this further in how we use this in FDA, that, that's through Monte Carlo. Um, but first, we need to talk about uh, risk and uncertainty um, because we estimate a relationship that expresses the probability of exceeding a level of damage over the probability of domain, but the estimate of expected annual damage that we get from this relationship is just one instance of expected annual damage, right? So the combination of these four curves gives us one estimate uh, or one instance of expected annual damage. Ultimately, our goal is to compute the likely distribution of expected annual damage, okay? But before we get there, we're going to spend some time talking about uh, uncertainty in this estimate and in particular about the stage damage relationship. And then using this uncertainty, we can talk about getting our distribution of expected annual damage. All right. Richard, Before, Richard yes, what yes. would the calculus like the calculus be if if you went back to the other diagram mm -hmm. and as well as building a dam, you were to elevate some structures to get them out of the damage pool? Is that would that be a box? Would that be an additional box that we take out? I'm trying to figure out um, what the math looks like. Yeah, so if we if we elevate some structures, flood proof them, mm -hmm. we're gonna in modify addition. the stage the state in addition. Yeah. We'll modify the stage yeah. damage function. Uh Okay. So, so you'll see it for, in the stage damage you'll see it in the stage damage function. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. So for, for different stages we have a lower level of damage. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. you for, for bringing that up. All right. Okay, before we jump into uncertainty, um, and, and we'll study the, the stage damage relationship in detail, I want to look at an example to summarize what we've just learned. So here is a picture of the Greenbrook flood control project in with project conditions. <laughs> I saw that face, Naomi. Yeah, Greenbrook can... Um, it, 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 I'll leave that aside, um, but we're just going to use this as an example um, because I think this is a pretty cool photo. So we can see pretty clearly that the flood wall here has pre pre prevented damage from this event, right? Um, so let's walk through the risk equation for the event in the image. What describes the hazard? Please type your answers into the chat. In this image, what, what describes the hazard? What's the hazard? Don't think about this um, in too complicated. This is this is um, a, a simple answer. It's just the flooding. It's the inundation. It's it's the water that you see on this image. That's the hazard. What is system performance? And let's talk about system performance as we see it in the image. What is system performance? Ethan, I like your answer a lot. We're looking at how well the wall is holding the water back. And from what we can see, the system performance seems to be 100% for this particular event. What is the exposure in this image? What is, how, how do we, um, Describe exposure in this image. 
please type your answers into the chat. What what gives us exposure? Shreya, you're on point. We're looking at the building and then potentially the people inside this building. Um, you can see that uh, these buildings look like classic apartment buildings in the Northeast, right? So we can assume that there are probably people in there. And, and there, is, there are structures that are exposed to flood damage. How about vulnerability? This one may be a little bit more challenging to, to um, describe, but I'd like for you to, to give it a good attempt. What, is, what describes vulnerability in this image? So how vulnerable are the structures? How vulnerable are, are the people to um, being impacted by flooding? Tread, elevation is important, absolutely, um, and, and in two different ways. So when we think about how vulnerable a structure is to flood damage, our um, most important signal is the elevation of the first floor. And if you look closely, you can see that uh, the back entrance to the building on the left is above grade. Right, and you can tell because the the entrance is much higher than the outbuilding, the little gray building on the left. So uh, we can see that the first floor elevation is probably a few feet above grade. So that describes the vulnerability of the building. And then if we think about the vulnerability of the people inside the building, this is a two-story building, and so folks do have the ability to um, get themselves to a higher elevation given that they are um, able to do so. All right, the, the last piece of the risk equation here, with a depth of, um, let's see, w what are the consequences in this image? What are the consequences in this image? Preston's got it. Um, the, the consequences would be structure damage. But in this image, the consequences are zero, right? There, there is no damage happening during this event um, at, at 7.06 p.m. on August 28, 2011. There are no damages at this point um, in the Greenbrook Flood Control Project. If the water overtopped the levee, then we would have we would have damage to the structures, and that would describe our consequences. Okay, uh, a few more quiz questions. Which input relationships? So either the flow exceedance, stage discharge, or stage damage were modified from the without project conditions here. Which input relationships? Michael, you're right, stage flow, right? For a given flow in the river, we have reduced the stage of the water in the floodplain. So our stage flow relationship is modified for, for really a range of peak discharges in the channel. The depth of flooding is zero in the floodplain. Now we also have a modification of the stage damage function that results from, that is where we truncate the stage damage function because we have modified the stage flow function. And that reduces the frequency of damages. One last question 
assuming that this is a very infrequent event, um, and this was Irene, I think Irene was uh, somewhere between a 75 and 100 year event, which is larger for this segment of the project? Flood damage reduced from this event or expected annual damage reduced? So, the, the, the constructed levy is going to reduce um, damages, and which is larger, the reduction in damages from this event or the reduction in expected annual damage, which is larger, assuming that this is a very infrequent event. Michael's got it. It's this event, right? Expected annual damage is like a probability weighted average. Um, so in years where there is no flooding, expected annual damage is going to be a lot higher than the, the damage that actually occurs, which is zero. But in years where there is flooding, the flood damage is going to be larger than expected annual damage in the without project condition. So the flood damage reduced from this event is going to be larger than expected hand damage reduced. Ethan, in the long run, it's even. I I would agree, um, but our focus is is this year. If this is the peak flow, peak stage, um, we're looking at damage from this particular event as compared to um, expected hand damage. All right, Ethan, I'm glad you're having fun. I am having fun too. Okay, uh, we're at slide 21. We're about to get into uncertainty of flood risk. We just went through a lot of material. We're about an hour in. So let's take a five minute break. Uh, let you take a breather. Think about it, uh, the material we just went over. Let's Let's resume in, so it'll be 8.01 a.m. for me, so 8, 9, 10, 11, 11.01. Let's resume at 11.01. All right, folks. Um, and then we're going to get into uncertainty and flood risk and how we use that uncertainty to get us a distribution of expected annual damage. All right, so let's just take a brief break, and we'll restart at 8.01. 
Hi, folks. It, it is 8.01 a.m. here, 11.01 a.m. there. Let's um, get back into our presentation. I'll give folks just one or two more minutes uh, to, to rejoin us. Now, Ethan, I, I am also an economist who really gets excited about calculus. So um, maybe I'm an exception to the rule, um, and, and ex engineering economists like are, are just the folks who, who like calculus, but uh, calculus gets me excited. All right, let's get started. So we're going to look at uncertainty and flood risk, and the uncertainty and flood risk is going to help us assess a distribution of expected annual damage. Now we're going to start with uncertainty in hydrology, looking at how the water moves through the watershed, um, and that's typically measured by discharge. And and this is a really important um, part of our presentation because flood risk, expected annual damage, is most sensitive. It, it's typically most sensitive to uncertainty in hydrology, right? So recall that our flow exceedance probability function, um, that's our hydrologic relationship, that gets us the peak flow or the distribution in peak flows for a given uh, exceedance probability. All right, that's our, our flow exceedance probability describes our hydrology. All right, let's look at hydrologic data and relationships, and then we'll look at uncertainty in, in the hydrology. So our water surface profiles uh, tell us what is the water surface elevation and the flow at a given location. And, and the hydrologic part of that is the flow. So the flow at a given location and frequency, that's determined either through observations or hydrologic modeling. Um, the observations are the peak flow, the annual peak flow, and under, in other words, the, the largest flow each year. Now the flow in ATCFDA is only used at the index location, um, and the flow exceedance is computed using data. Um, I'm sorry, the flow is only used at the index location, the flow within your water surface profiles, and that's only if the flow exceedance is computing using data in the water surface profile. Sometimes we get a, a flow exceedance curve um, directly from, from engineering that's not in the water surface profiles. So these flow exceedance probability functions, again, they, they, they give us a, a range of or a distribution of flows for a given exceedance probability. Now there can there there are two different um, approaches for identifying the flow exceedance probability function. The first is the analytical approach, where the flow can be described by log Pearson type three distribution. Um, the uncertainty is defined by the log Pearson type 3 moments, the first, second, and third moment. First is the expected value, second is the variance or standard deviation, and third is skew. Um, the LP3 moments can be entered directly into HECFDA or estimated using the 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and 0 0.01 annual exceedance probability events, and that's when we compute synthetic statistics. Now, graphical exceedance probability functions are used when the flow cannot be described by the log Pearson type 3. And typically, this is for, um, for situations where you have um, tidal influence or situations where you have backwater, um, things where either the flow and stage don't coincide or uh, there's another situation. We'll get into graphical versus analytical um, during the, the second session. Now, the graphical exceedance probability functions, this is just drawing drawing a straight line between the flows. Uh, in FDA, we, we do need to define the flow for the 0.999 annual exceedance probability event um, through the 0 0.001 annual exceedance probability event. Um, we have to help FDA to draw that line. Um, FDA does not extrapolate below the most frequent event, so it, the putting in the one-year event is particularly important so that we don't overestimate the risk. 
And the uncertainty is defined by the equivalent record length and the distance between the flow using order statistics and the less simple method together with the normal distribution. And you can get into the uncertain how we use graphical exceedance probability functions and the uncertainty around these things um, in the technical reference manual, the HCFTA technical reference manual. All right. So what defines the uncertainty around our flow exceedance function? When we're looking at um, analytical using uh, peak flows from observations, so we, we get peak flows from uh, a USGS gauge, there may be measurement uncertainty. So there may be inaccurate measurement of the water depth. There's transform uncertainty, which could result from inaccurate modeling uh, for converting the water depth to a flow rate. There's possible sampling uncertainty where the history of observations may not describe the variability well. The record may be too short or just unrepresentative. Uh, and then there's model uncertainty where the log Pearson type 3 distribution may not represent the data at a given site very well. Then if we're doing analytical using modeling uh, or graphical exceedance probability functions, uh, we're looking at boundary condition uncertainty. Uh, within what boundary do we use precipitation data and other atmospheric variables? There is initial condition uncertainty, what is the soil moisture, channel base flow, so on and so forth at the start of the simulation. There's model uncertainty here too, what is the correct representation of the hydrologic process. And there's parameter uncertainty, what are the correct values for the parameters in each process. Um, you may hear a lot about Manning's N coefficient, right, um, and other parameters like this flow over a weir. Uh, um, how, how the flow moves. So the parameters that define that, there, there's uncertainty in that. Now, the sampling of an analytical flow frequency function takes place by sampling a new mean um, from the normal distribution and a new variance from the chi-square distribution and then computing an LP3. Um, so that is USGS Bulletin 17B, where the uncertainty in the log Pearson type 3 is defined by sampling the mean and the variance. Now, FDA 2.0 is going to use USGS Bulletin 17C, where we sample, we're going to sample the mean, we're going to sample the variance, and we're going to sample the skew. Okay, so it's um, 2.0 is going to make a couple of improvements in the way that we evaluate risk, um, including implementing 17C. So again, it, it, I just want to emphasize that damage is usually usually most sensitive to hydrologic uncertainty. So that is uncertainty about the flow exceedance relationship. If you're going straight to stage probability, um, then this hydrologic uncertainty is baked in together with the hydraulic uncertainty. All right, one more slide on hydrologic uncertainty. Here we show some sampled curves, many sampled curves with um, uncertainty that has been developed using observational data uh, and the log Pearson type 3. So you can observe that the 90% confidence interval is tighter on the right where we have um, curves estimated from 120 data points than the distribution on the left where the curves are estimated from 30 data points. And, and this is a typical result. Um, if you recall back to your statistics courses, the standard error is going to be lower with a larger sample. And that intuition applies here as well. Uh, just one note that uh, FDA samples within the 95% confidence interval, not the 90%. Uh, we did not cover transform flow here, but we will do that during the second session as well. All right. Now we'll move on to uncertainty and flood risk um, as it relates to hydraulic, hydraulics. Um, so hydraulics that describes the stages for a given flow. So the stage flow or stage discharge or rating curve, it has many names, tells us the distribution of stages for a given discharge. So it is plotted inversely here. So what are the hydraulic data and relationships? From the water surface profiles, we get the water surface elevation. 
um, we need a water surface elevation at a given location and frequency. These are computed using hydrologic modeling. The hydrologic modeling is HEC RAS. Um, I forgot to mention that the, hy the hydraulic modeling, excuse me, is HEC RAS. The hydrologic modeling is HEC HMS um, or SSP. So the water surface elevations, they're used to compute damage at a structure, either by, through interpolation between stations or identifying the water surface elevation at the structure's location in the case of 2D modeling. Um, FDA 2.0 is going to um, use 2D modeling much easier than FDA 1.4.x. We will talk about how we can use 2D modeling with FDA version 1.4.x during the second session. So our stage discharge function, the rating curve, that's the main, the, the main hydraulic relationship. Um, this gives us the distribution of stages for given discharge, and typically this is computed using observations on stage versus flow, again from a USGS gauge. And the error bounds are computed using hydraulic modeling. Typically the, the error bounds are defined by a triangular distribution, but can also be normal or log normal. Now the third piece of the hydraulic um, inputs and hydraulic uncertainty is the hydraulic structures. How does the water react to hydraulic structures? We're looking at levees, diversions, dams, weirs, drop structures, bridges, culverts, so on and so forth. So we, want, we need to know how the water reacts to that um, in the channel and in the floodplain. Now, real quick, uh, who remembers how the stage discharge function could be impacted by the construction of the levee? And let's make this a, a, a two-point question. How might the stage discharge function, the, the stage discharge function inside the levee, so in the floodplain, be impacted as well as outside the levee that is in the channel? How does a levee impact the stage discharge function inside the levee, in the floodplain, and outside the levee, in the channel? Please type Francis into the chat. Give you one more minute to think it through. Michael, you got it. So the stage discharge function will be truncated inside the levee, in the floodplain. Right? For a given flow, the stage will be zero up to the top of the levee. So the stage discharge function is is truncated inside the levee, that's in the floodplain. But outside the levee, if we're looking at um, a river that is relatively narrow, levees can actually um, increase the stage for a given discharge because we're sort of pushing the water in, okay? Um, and, and that really is for, for cases where you're looking at a relatively narrow channel. If you're looking at um, a really wide river or you're looking at a coastal situation, then it's unlikely that the stage will be uh, changed for a given discharge. All right, so what are the pieces of uncertainty in our hydraulic data in relationships? So the uncertainty in the water surface profiles, again, this is um, assessed through hydraulic models, and the uncertainty um, can come from applying uh, incorrect procedures where the assumptions are not good through numerical errors, um, measurement errors, and, and parameter estimation. Uh, and I misspoke. This is where Manning's N comes into account. Now, the hydraulic modelers, they are trained to identify the appropriate modeling method um, to utilize and develop sound models, uh, but there is uncertainty in data collection and parameter estimation. The, the main factors that affect model uncertainty come from measurements of geometry data, such as cross-sections and terrain, um, and parameters, such as Manning's N values, cross-section properties, such as ineffective flow areas, levees, and hydraulic structure coefficients, so like weirs, gates, and culvert coefficients. So developing the assessment of uncertainty, um, so a little, okay. Let me step back. Let's let's look at um, stage discharge 
the factors there are like changes in cross section and roughness over the part of the channel that's being assessed. There's measurement error, there's influence of backwater, um, and backwater uh, can make uncertainty in hydraulics. Um, it can it can compound the uncertainty in hydraulics. And so is there something I want to emphasize about the stage discharge? I think that's it. Um, the, the biggest thing that we hear about with uncertainty around the rating curve is the um, the parameter uncertainty. That's that's those are the other factors. Um, things like Manning's N. So, um, and if you're not familiar with Manning's N, this tells us how the water reacts over to um, the surface over which it's flowing. So whether there there is um, there could be a lot of uh, trees and things around the, the river which which would add friction to the water flowing over the surface. Um, if you have a really smooth channel, then there's less friction. Roughness, roughness coefficient. Thanks, Naomi. All right. Our last piece here is uncertainty around the hydraulic structures. Again, we're looking at um, things like bridges, culverts, inline structures, lateral structures, boundary conditions. Um, so what is the uncertainty around the way that the water um, moves around these uh, structures. So we're thinking about weir coefficients, pressure flow coefficients, um, dam breach parameters, levee breach parameters, um, things of this sort. Okay. Now one more um, piece to the uncertainty before we get to economics, and that's levee performance. Um, HEC FDA 1.4.x does not actually look at uncertainty in performance, um, but 2.0 will allow us to model uncertainty in um, levy performance. So I will, while we, we don't actually consider uncertainty in levy performance in FDA, um, that is uncertainty about the fragility curve, uh, it is useful to to walk through how we use the fragility curve to um, impact our assessment of risk. So without a levy, we have relative certainty about the floodplain water surface elevations at a given discharge, right? So that's our dashed gray line here. If we assume the levy is perfect, this Cert relative certainty um, extends to the levied conditions. And the levied conditions here are reflected by the dashed black line, where the levy without fragility gives us perfect um, or, or zero damage up to the top of the levy elevation, at which point the damage for a given stage returns to without project conditions. Now, however, we, we know that levies occasionally fail. Um, often the consequences associated with breaches are worse than overtopping conditions because it may lead to higher flood depths, um, it may lead to higher velocities, and often takes people by surprise. Here we have not modeled the damage as being worse. With breach, um, we assume that it's no worse than the without project condition in this case. So in FDA, we calculate the damage that would occur if the levy was breached. All right, so we have no levy uh, flow. The probability of failure, we look at the flow with the, oh, excuse me, we're looking at damage. I'm sorry, folks, this is not my slide. This is the first time I'm going through it. Not the first time. Um, this is the first time I'm teaching from this slide. So, okay, we have damage with no levy, the probability of failure. We'll look at the damage from the levy with fragility and without, and we compare the two to get us um, an assessment of damage. And so you see that we we have a level of damage at a stage of 70 feet when we take fragility into account. And basically this comes from, we're, we're looking at the chance of being within an interval of, of stages 
times the, the interval of damage for, for that uh, range. Whereas the levy with, oops, I keep clicking the wrong button. The, the damage for the levy without fragility is seemed to be perfect. All right. Cool. Now we're, now we're into the economics. Uh, Michael, can you define fragility or did I just do that? Uh, sorry if I did not define it. Fragility, this is the chance that a levy is breached for a given stage. Okay. Um, and is and it, an FP. does it have units or is it a, pro it's a probability? Probability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look at the middle column, the probability of levy failure, that's our fragility function. And this is in terms of probability. Does the levy with fragility, the multiplication of the does that have a unit the levy with or without fragility yes those are um measured in dollars okay so we have the probability of failure times the damage with no levy gives us the uh, probability weighted damage with um the levy uh fragility yeah. curve okay thanks mm-hmm Okay, now the part